Hello and welcome to Future Thinking from Stylus. I'm your host, Christian Ward, Head of Brand Engagement and Multimedia Strategy at Stylus. Today we're going to be discussing the power of biophilia and how nature can contribute to better workplaces, buildings and cities. To discuss this, I'm very pleased to say I'm joined by Thomas Heatherwick, designer and founder of Heatherwick Studios, which brings the practices of design, architecture and urban planning together in a single workspace. Heatherwick is behind recent acclaimed developments, including London's Coal Drops Yard, and is currently working on 30 projects in 10 countries, including Google headquarters in California and London. I'm also joined by Davy Pinati, Stylus's senior editor of product design. Welcome to you both. So Hi, Christian. let's start by defining this concept of biophilia, which I know, Davy, is something you talk about a lot on Stylus. Perhaps you could give us a quick introduction to this concept. Uh, yes, I'll try. Uh, so biophilia is the term um, used to describe our innate and genetically determined affinity with the natural world. So it explains that we are drawn to environments that have supported human life in the past. Um, so responding to nature is part of our genetic makeup. And we're becoming more and more aware of the benefits of being in and around nature on mental and physical health. And during lockdown, many of us have craved it um, and um, it's making us realize that nature is not a nice to have but really a must have and it's also why our team fell in love with the uh, STEM desking system uh, Thomas you designed when we saw it at the London Design Museum. Thank you, great. So what can you tell us about this STEM design for, for those who haven't seen it Thomas? Um, well, uh, the, in, the, in the studio's work over the last two decades, the focus has been on how to make environments that are more human-centric, I guess. I'd, I'd witnessed design as a very cerebral thing that felt like it, it, was, it thought it was dealing with function, and it defined function too narrowly and forgot that emotion is a function. And there was no point making something, whether that's a piece of city or building or furniture or place, if it's a kind of concept, but doesn't emotionally engage the users. And so in different ways with the different projects we've been working on, we've been trying to think of that. And that's gone from the macro scale such as a project like our Thousand Trees in Shanghai, where we are integrating so much nature that it will take 21 tons of carbon out of the air when it's completed and create oxygen for 2,000 people. Um, but it was interesting during the, this strange pandemic time that we've all been sharing across the world to also think about how that might affect the more immediate scale of furniture around us. And the STEM desk that we d developed is, it, in fact, it isn't really a desk, it's a, it's a leg. And the leg is like a G-clamp and cl can clamp any surface that you put in it. And it was a reaction against the plasticized desking, you know, just the word desking. Is it like a horrible, it gives you a feeling of all those plastic trims pushed into um, laminated chipboard. And it's, uh, so it, the project is, a, is legs. You could, you could buy one or you could buy 400. And it holds, um, uh, it, it simultaneously also is a vessel for nature. And uh, I, Actually, if we, if we pop out from these visuals, I'm, I'm sitting actually right next to it, the, the one that we made here. Um, I don't know if that's possible. Is if I can show you here. So we are, um, so there's the, this was all really very much coming from the logic that you can, um, if I just sit down here, um, that we, when you are, I mean, back in the old days, 
uh, in the, the, the time when I was being brought up and studying, you'd often have people who would be sitting there and then they'd have to, every hour they'd go off and smoke and then they'd come back and, um, you know, had reduced a few hours off their life, but they came back with a clear head. They did actually come back with a sort of perspective. And there was um, a couple called Rachel and Steve, Stephen Kaplan in the 1980s who developed attention restoration theory, I think, was, which had a handy acronym of ART. And that, that was really based on the, that looking for 40 seconds or more on a regular basis through a day into an at nature was something that would restore your attention and re-awaken um, your alertness and senses. And I, I've certainly found that there's been so much emphasis on the human made stuff and not enough on the counterbalance, the thing that's a relief from madeness. And so you go into environments, everything's so hard. And the, this, I think there are things that can work on many levels, but the ability to look for, into the infinite is something that made things often don't give you that chance. And so if you look at a piece of um, laminate, let's take a laminate if we're talking about, and look at it, there's not much to look at. You're just looking at it and you get bored very quickly and that's that. But when you look into a piece of stone which has got the life inside it, in a sense, it triggers your imagination, whereas that piece of a laminate doesn't trigger your imagination at all because there is nothing changing within it. And in, in our work in Asia and in China, some of the scholars' rocks, and these, these were very old things that people would have in their homes, but they are amazingly abstract. I think we think we invented abstraction, but actually they were using and even helping to shape these into things that you could look at and you could almost infinitely look at because your mind could see it like clouds or like flames or like the sea, there's the infinite. And there's a dimension of that that sounds all dreamy and sort of, it, uh, but actually is a, there's a dimension of that that we all subliminally need, I think, even if we haven't overtly realized that there is a role for, um, for something other as a relief and this is, I think, why aging, there's an embracing of aging and, and in, in, in biophilia, and it's something that in, across all our projects, things that are, have permission to be old. And I think in Japan, there's the term wabi-sabi for things that patinate and, and enjoy imperfection. And I think it's a funny one in our lives, we have to learn to to accept imperfection in the ourselves, in others, in materials, and yet the architectural and the built world has created amazingly perfect, amazingly white, and amazingly bad at aging objects and places. So, um, and I think there's a celebration of clean lines and the, uh, the urbanist Jane Jacobs, who wrote the book, the uh, death and life of great American cities. She was saying that this is the problem with designers. They always make clean lines. And basically that's, and cities don't want to be clean. The cleaner the lines of the planning of cities, the more sterile they are. And I'm very interested in those forces that are at play in the designer's mind that wants to create order and pattern. And and the force of the subtle, like if you say, oh, that's subtle, it sounds good. I mean, who would ever disagree with subtle as a word? It just sounds beautiful. And we all think we're subtle somehow. And yet the, that subtlety in city planning made some phenomenally boring things that actually we are now pushing back against in our need for more interest, diversity, and I think diversity for me is a, a big key of something that's needed more, in, not only in the people who design things,
but also hopefully as there's more diversity in the people who design things in the outcomes of what's designed. Yeah, and you just mentioned the um, diversity in cities and um, you mentioned a thousand trees and I think it's so interesting in your, some of your Asian projects that, you know, it, you think beyond the building so it becomes almost like a, a sloping hillside or a valley. So how do you think about you know, changing that landscape as part of architecture? Well, I always found it, ever since I was little, I was a bit bemused as to why buildings hit the ground so uh, rigidly and that the relationship to ground seemed something that was worth looking at and exploring. And in Rudolf Steiner's theories, the philosopher who had theories about farming and dance and architecture and literature and so many things. They were also interested in why shouldn't buildings come out of the ground in the same way that a rock would. And if a rock is coming through the ground, it isn't at a right angle. It emerges from the ground and dips back into the ground. So I think that um, buildings has been extruded extrapolations of land ownership rather than necessarily thinking about the feeling for the public around those buildings as they encounter them and I think often too much emphasis has been put on the tops of buildings rather than the bit where 99.9% .9 of people are which is the ground and the street and the road and so I've, I'm trying to sort of put a focus there but I think that the silhouettes and the relationships to the ground and I suppose in the things we're doing we've been trying to question and explore and research those things as much as possible. The Thousand Trees really was m softening the edge because right next to us is the main art district in Shanghai called M50 and that art district consists of a collection of approximately two-story industrial buildings that were there was a flour mill and then there were plastics factories and it felt that slamming up against them with a um with a 30-story building <laughs> didn't seem polite and and also it also felt that our job should be to make the art district become bigger rather than be the wall against the art district. So this is the first half of the project that's now nearing completion. And many of those trees in it have already been sitting there for two and a half, three years and are really thriving. And it, in, it's sort of, I suppose some of the thoughts that we drove a project like this feel more relevant than ever now with the global pandemic that we've all experienced because They've been about making outdoor space an acceptable part of our lives in the work environment, in, in every context, which we've had these sort of two very binary thing of the outdoor world as if it's just a polluted, terrible, disgusting thing. And then you suddenly air conditioned, hermetically sealed indoors. And that project by that move of making something that came softly to meet the art district buildings, allowed us to make 300 outdoor terraces, which meant that even uh, a coffee shop could have an outdoor terrace or a children's kindergarten space could have outdoor spaces and work. Um, you know, not, how often have, um, I mean, so often homes have balconies and outdoor terraces, but workspaces don't. And yet we spend more of the, our time in, our, in the past was spent in workplaces. So why wouldn't you have the qualities you, you aspire to in your home in a workplace uh, of places you can be outdoors, in nature? What, what are the things that bring out the best versions of ourselves and the, the old fashioned workplace? Funny to call it old fashioned now, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one year ago, ye olde workplace, you know, it was so, it seemed to be chasing a weird, idea of the worker as, as a uh, as an statistic to be efficiently handled and 
we've been designing workplace uh, for a number of years now on all sorts of different projects. And it was, I think back to all the funny conversations about efficiency, you know, efficiency of movement and efficiency of seating people at desks. And efficiency means nothing if you don't actually have the deep engagement and enthusiasm of a team. So the priority, efficiency, is enthusiasm, engagement, real belief in a purpose of an organization. And, all, and this so-called efficiency follows after. It isn't the thing that leads and then you'll have default um, loyalty and purpose. So everything down from the micro to the wh where you sit and the potential to be surrounded in, a, in your workplace by something that's alive and living to the scale of city. How do you make cities that feel truly varied, but also nurture the human scale? And sort of most importantly, sort of bring us together. Because mm -hmm. I certainly this situation has given us lots of excuses to not be together. And ongoing, the introverts can, can have lives of true introversion in beautiful bliss. And, um, but when we do come together, it's going to need to be pretty special in order to uh, get the best of ourselves, which does come so often from real proximity and inspiring each other. Yeah, David, it'd be interesting to, to hear your take on that in terms of what we're looking at sort of post pandemic, I suppose, when it comes to the influences on design um, as a result of this, you know, spitting a part of community and bringing it back together again. What are, what are the priorities do you think that designers will be looking at? Um, well, I think it's really what Thomas says, like how do we create connectivity, connection? Um, you know, so many parts of our lives have changed or things we've, we've now come to realize that we can per work perfectly well and focused at home and the office needs to be about being a magnet to bring people together. So I think it's so interesting that nature can be a leading element that can, can give that to people, that can give people something that you can't get at home if you don't have access to a garden. It can be uh, a place for greenery. I think that's, that's so exciting. And I think the focus on health is probably also gonna be much bigger since um, we've, a lot of us have been affected. Our mental health has been affected majorly. Um, more people are aware what our interiors um, mean for, for our well-being. So I think a focus on healthy materials is not just growing in uh, commercial projects like the workplace, but also for residential um, um, environments where you know, natural light, um, clean air, uh, low emission materials um, are something that consumers are really going to pay attention to as well. Yeah, Thomas, I believe that you um your project the maggie center in leeds is uh, a charity center that provides support for people with cancer uh, and their loved ones and it's immersed with plants inside and out so sort of as as davy was talking about this idea of how nature can be healing and and help with mental health maybe could you discuss a little bit about what the the design the motivations were behind that well it, it's I mean, we were talking about the role of nature in mental health earlier, of, of the person in the workplace or in our lives. But um, the, I was interested in how the Georgians and the Victorians saw our cities. And when there were the cholera outbreaks and the UK was the first country to industrialize. And then there were the, all these cholera outbreaks as people were all pushed close together. And we had the, in a way, luckily misattributed cholera outbreaks, which were thought to be because of the miasma, the air that was giving people the, these um, disease and illness, um, where, when actually it was the water sources. But because they thought it was the air, they took immediate action and built these parks throughout the cities. And so British cities have historically been the greenest of their size in the world per head of population because the Victorians and Georgians sort of insisted on 
these um, integrating nature in that way. And so we've got this legacy of street trees, heathlands, um, parks, and green squares throughout, rather than the sense you have one big park in a city and everywhere else is um, a sort of hardcore city. Um, and so the, I found it powerful going to other places in the world where that isn't there. You, 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 it takes you a while to diagnose and you think, why don't I feel good? Just why don't, and then later you realize there were no street trees. And you think, no street trees, that's so powerful. And when we were working on the project at St. James's Hospital in Leeds, in the north of England, we were asked to create a cancer care centre. And the site we were given for this building was the last green piece of site on the whole hospital campus. And we were just there going, oh no, we don't want to be the ones who kill that. And it, in fact, it was, the, it was a rubbish dump for the construction waste for a car park. So there was this, and they, they just put a thin veneer of grass turf across the top and a couple of bushes. And so we used it as a spur, I guess, for something that we were interested in anyway, but also felt very uh, emboldened by uh, a duty to the hospital patients and staff to try to heal up um, the, that piece of land and give back more than we were taking away. And so instead of the, the building as buildings so normally are these boxes, just bang, get, goes, goes down the dead box. And even if it's a sort of interesting dead box, it's still a, a kind of um, pushes away, repels its borders. We thought, well, what if it felt instead like we lifted up the garden? And it also, when you're making a place that's about healing it seemed to us that nature is a really important component in that and the ability to create horticulture on the hospital site that has never been there ever before and basically make use it as an excuse to make the most amazing garden so in a sense my studio we're turning into landscape architects really we just use every architectural opportunity to push further and deeper into an agenda of making places that can feel like they are um, uh, like it, like you explore a garden. Um, if you're exploring somewhere uh, which has got variety and texture and also movement. We mustn't forget that when the breeze moves, you suddenly have kinetic architecture. If you consider the plants part of the architecture, and if you go through some of the other images. Um, uh, you'll see um, it's, it's very simple in a sense. It's three planters, and these three planters hold major swathes of, of garden, and you can go up and then access into the garden. And the, the philosophy that was in the brief for this was to be creating the architecture of hope. And I feel that, in a sense, everywhere has to be a place of hope because there are loads of dark forces scaring the wits out of children, the elderly, everyone. There's a lot in life to be fearful of, you could say, but there's also so much joy that we can have together while we try to make the best of the world we have. And, um, and the using uh, wood to make the structure and all breathable materials the proposition of three planters that grow out um, and then let the nature through in and amongst those planters as well gave actually quite a sophisticated place and um, we always do hundreds of studies and studies and studies and we started with seven and nine and we ended up just the simplicity that just three things could give us something that could hopefully feel warm and it was a funny balance of something that needed to be affordable to do with the, the budget that was available, but that also could lift your aspiration that a cancer diagnosis doesn't mean automatically that this is a life sentence, but it, it's, a, it's certainly a trigger of a new phase of life, um, but that it's only through hope that we can go through 
treatments and maybe find even new joys that we might not have experienced before. So that's a smaller building compared to some of our other things, but it, it felt important to us to engage with and some of the things we've been really interested in could play an important part. I think it's such a beautiful building and I think it's also so interesting to see that these this idea of the planter and like vessels for, for nature work on all these different skills so as a as a massive development but also as a smaller building and then even as a as a desk there's these ideas of um, things that hold nature that we live with um, made from beautiful materials thank you thank you so much. yeah it's beautiful beautiful and and you know uh, i was going to ask you know and i realized we're running out of time so we won't really get to this but i was going to ask about the kind of commercial you know challenges of these things but as you but as you say there that was an affordable building to to put together you say so there were the budget was not massive these things are doable on smaller scales which is really fantastic too um as i say i think you know, we sort of run out of time davy i don't know whether there's anything that else you wanted to ask obviously i will take a, a, a taking a back seat a little bit here because you are the expert um, well, I would love to talk for much longer, of course, but uh, <laughs> I think I think it's so interesting that you approach nature as something that's not just cosmetic, but really a critical element of, of our future infrastructure. So not beautification, but a basic element for, um, you know, our, our, our cities moving forward. Um, and yeah, just um maybe just just wondering where where you see this going if we could do this around the world and and in our workplace and in our homes well i think that there are i think there's a, a huge amount of possibility and i think we have lost touch of beauty i think i think that it's become the modern movement was really uplifting and the the huge sort of turmoil of at the beginning of the last century that carried through kind of blasted apart certain things that needed blasting apart, but it also um, pushed aside places that could really lift your spirit, I think, somehow. And I think we've, we have to learn how to make places that can be really moving for us rather than be moving for architects. And I think that there's been a sort of divergence where the architectural world has been happy with certain kinds of things, but actually the public have been left quite cold by many types of place. And it's not just the architectural profession, it's procurement. It's the way that um, the commercial world has been driving the agenda of making cities. And I think that the human side has got pushed a, 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 a apart. So I suppose I'm hoping that we can actually really tune in to ourselves and that the powerlessness that people feel about the cities around them. I think people do feel empowered with their own garden. They feel empowered in the kitchen with food. But I think that growing a sense of empowerment that we can make the cities that support our humanity is something that we've got to find again and it's not happening by itself. Globalization is making really plain, boring, sterile, show off but shallow places. And I think we need to make, um, somehow find a way and nature I think will be an important component. And cities like Singapore are interesting for the way they've, my, their mindset of saying we're a city in a garden rather than saying they're a garden city, they're, they, they're embracing density that can make excitement in a city, but they're also embracing major pieces of the emotional side of nature, not as a stick on decoration. And I, in Tokyo, we're doing a, a very major city center project where we're creating huge amounts of landscape at the same time, hand in hand with making workspace, living space, even spiritual space and teaching space and shopping space all together. So I think that things can coexist. And I think we are, it's an interesting time ahead, 
but I think it's growing in people, the feeling that something can be done and that real sustainability is going to be both the environmental performance and massive reduction in the carbon, but also thinking about how people must love places. And without love, nothing is sustainable anyway. So it, it's, it sort of sounds so dumb and basic and a too neat a way to end a, a podcast. But I just think it's true. No, I think that's a perfect way to end the podcast. Thank you so much. So much food for thought there. Um, I'm now going to spend 40 seconds looking at some nature to recharge my brain. And I hope uh, you listening will do the same. Um, so thank you so much. I'd like to thank my guests, Thomas Heatherwick and Davy Pinati. And thank you for listening. I hope you'll join us next time for more future thinking from Stylus. Thank you.